of the Bedouin tribesmen. A people at peace with the simplicity of the desert, a civilization whose origins are lost in the mists of time. Here in the United Arab Emirates, they file the Bible under modern fiction. This, of course, is all very interesting, but we're here because this is the world capital of speed. They even like their food fast. Yes, I'll have a McSheep's head, please, and make it snappy. when the Arab was a bit flash. Back in the nouveau riche days, he'd buy an Escort Cosworth like this and change the headlamps for chandeliers. He had absolutely no taste whatsoever, but he had a wad like a skyscraper and he wanted the rest of the world to know it. However, those days are long gone. Uh, I changed the engine and uh, I changed the suspension and uh, the tires, the rings, and uh, completed the exhaust system and the steering also. So how many horsepower does it produce now? Now it is 420 horsepower. Do you ever feel the temptation, because these lovely quiet roads, do you ever feel tempted to come out here and see how fast it'll go? No, I didn't try that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Are you lying? <laughs> <laughs> no, sure, I'm talking, because... I mean, the power that is in the car is very difficult in the top speed to be controlled. Difficult to control, eh? Well, that must make this little lot a right old handful. What we have here is an F40, an F50, a Porsche 959 and an XJ220, four of the rarest, fastest cars in the world, and they all belong to one man. So what's the big thing in the Arab mentality that makes you want to go so fast? I think it is in us for so many years, I mean, uh, to do with the uh, horses mainly, because uh, a horse at that time, it's not just uh, uh, a transport uh, thing that we use, but it's mainly of uh, speed, you get there faster. And then um, races has been here for generations, and uh, it's still, it's a big uh, sport here. So do you get out there and give these cars some stick? Sometimes you have to. I mean, otherwise, why do I buy them for? Uh, people tell me that, OK, this is not the place for them. You have to go to south of France and maybe in America and enjoy them. In a way, yes, but I don't think you can really enjoy the cars. If people are looking to show off and then to um, go after girls, maybe that's the place. But if you are looking after using them and really enjoying them, I think our place is suitable, more suitable for them. Is this a big car culture out here? I mean, when you drive these cars down the street, are the kids really enthusiastic, as they are in yes. Italy, say? Yes, sometimes because of my fame here as a rally driver, they know me by the face more than just the car. And, um, I mean, I remember a few uh, incidents that just leaving from the gate of my house, there were about four guys with uh, Skylands, uh, this Nissan Skylands, mm. and they were about 18 years old, if not younger, and red cars also and they wanted to race me. And they took me about for the next 20 miles. They were beside me, making circles around me. And they begged me to race. And I said, that's not the place. But at the end, I knew I had to do something. So then I blasted the car, and then they were happy, and then they left. 
OK, let's just say, Mohammed, you woke up in the morning, the sun's shining, it's a weekend, you've got nothing on, and you've got to go for a blast, yeah? Which yes. one of these cars are you going to take? If, it, if the weather is right, I think I'll take the F50. This is the ultimate, then, is it? Yes, to me, is these cars, they give, they give me... Sometimes, you know, people, rich people... I'm not that rich, but rich people, very rich people, maybe... What is enjoyment to them? OK, you die, I don't think you have uh, pockets in your coffin. Yeah. So I'm not going to take it. So enjoy it. I think the power also is drive to the uh, wheels in a nice, very nicely. So you don't get this of sudden uh, impact in you or it catch you when you are not really ready for it. Let's give it a blast. Oh, my. Surprisingly, an Arab is yet to make a serious mark in international motorsport. But in other types of racing, the tiny state of Dubai is unbeatable. In 1995, Dubai-owned horses won every major race in Britain and the Irish Derby and the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. I just wanted to say that Sheikh Maku and decided to... And in offshore powerboat racing, the Italians have been left shivering and dumbfounded in the wake of the Arab victory boat. It's a 43-footer with two Chevy V8s and a top speed of 144 miles an hour. It won the World Championship last year partly because it's built to survive crashes like this. It's my job to keep the 1,800 horsepower projectile in a straight line. Not easy, as by now we're doing 130 miles an hour. What is it with these guys? Uh, I don't think we're the only Arabs that, uh, or the only people that love speed. A lot of people worldwide, they love speed. But you uh, find more people here who seem to be just completely addicted to it than anywhere else. Well, it's something that is with, you know, got to do with a little bit of, a lot of pride, and then we have a winning team. And we use this win to, you know, promote our country. Tell you something for nothing, this grid is for real. You can forget cars now, forget them. They're all dull, they're all tedious. This is it. I've always known that boats provide the best high-octane fun, but that was before they introduced me to the desert. After work, most nights, kids head out to the sandy wastelands for a spot of dune bashing. The game is simple. Pick a slope and see if you can drive up it. Ideally, you need special sand tyres and an engine that's tuned like a concert Steinway. Shoulder. Best off roader. Two, second gear. Third gear, we're out to 80 kilometers an hour. Stop to get feel out here. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. If at first you don't succeed, solve it. Crashing is about the only aspect of life in the Gulf where you don't haggle. Long before the oil, this was a thriving trading post. Dows plied the seaways between here and Bombay, and merchants dealt in fish. Cheese, fridge freezers, gold, hamsters, broccoli. Well, you've got the idea. But it wasn't until they found they were sitting on an ocean of oil that the serious money started to roll in. I'm talking about the sort of money you need to build up a collection of metal like this. 
All these cars and dozens more besides belong to Abu Dhabi's Rainbow Shake. He's such a good customer for Mercedes-Benz that when he got married and needed a fleet of S-Classes, they stopped the production lines to paint and trim them, even the rifles in the boot. Pretty soon, though, he was bored by mainstream cars, and in 1986, he started to make his own. This was an early attempt, part Volkswagen Beetle, part lunar buggy, part magic carpet. It has no name, so I shall call it the Bird Puller. His latest project is to build a people carrier jet boat so he can get his family to his island in palatial, air-conditioned, citron-type splendor. But strangely, his all-time favourite vehicle is the 1950s Dodge Power Wagon. It holds a special place in his heart because it's synonymous, inseparable even, from the oil boom. Early oil prospectors relied on them when they were out in the desert with their divining twigs. And he's so grateful, he's built a monument in its honour. Large! <laughs> Isn't it? You know, I've been around the world five times to make this series, and what we have here in the middle of the Arabian desert is the most amazing, most sensational, most outlandish, and by far the largest car in the entire world. The wheels are from an oil rig transporter, the wipers from an ocean liner, and the headlights cost a thousand pounds each. Every detail is exactly 64 times bigger than the American original, a point that becomes blindingly obvious when you step inside. Of course, the big advantage of pickup trucks is they have tailgates, which can be opened. I think, no, I know that this is the best view I have ever had from the back of a pickup truck. In between races, I could pop up to the master bedroom, which is where the cab should be. You know, this is impressive stuff, but it does have one more trick up its sleeve. Underneath, there's an engine, a steering wheel, and, crucially, a driver's seat. You did like school. <laughs> I do not believe what I just saw. It moved! There are so many questions, like how and why, that I think it's time to meet the man who built it, the Rainbow Shake. We built all the pieces of this truck, nearly 25 major pieces, in Abu Dhabi, and we take it by a truck to here and we assemble it in the desert, because we can't assemble it in the city because it's uh, very wide, it's nearly eight metres wide. What sort of engine does it have on it? We have a small engine, it's not very big, but it's to move it only for small distance. It is industrial engine, they call it GM, 
ديترويت ديزل 6 سلندر بس اتس نوت فيري بيج 300 هورس باور هاو ماتش از ات واي وي دونت نو اكزاكتلي بس از نيرلي 50 تن ميبي 50 تن هي هاز اذر كارافانز اوف كورس بس اف يو ار ثينكينج سبرايت الباين فورجيت ات This, believe it or not, is an attempt at miniaturization because it's exactly a million times smaller than the real world. In old days, they used to the bad weather and the very difficult life, you know. But now, uh, the family, they need uh, water, they need hot water. And this uh, type of um, camber, When you sit inside, you don't feel you are in the desert because you have all the facility you have it in the city. Why did you build it, the shape of a globe? It is good looking and it's my dream since 10 years to, to find a big basement trailer to build this globe in it. And the globe, it looks nice uh, in the desert because it's something uh, modern in the middle of the empty area. Most of the time the desert is indeed empty and quiet and peaceful and the Sheikh really can be left alone in his own little world. But once a year the huge expat community in the UAE comes out here for an orgy of incompetence. They call it the Fun Run, and this is the overnight rest halt. There is wine, there is song, and there are women too, but for some extraordinary reason, you rarely see one driving. There is more people, we are going together, losting together, uh, finding the way, it's very nice. Really. And regarding the woman driving, uh, I, I didn't... So anyone, up till now, anyone, but tomorrow I let her to try. If we're still alive, I'll take her place. <laughs> You've never been on one of these before? No, no, this is the first time. So at weekends, do you go out in the desert? Yes, but I never drive. I am sort of a passenger, and I that... enjoy the scenery. It can be dangerous, you know, to go out in the desert on your own, just uh, because you can get into trouble, and it's much safer if you've got a lot of people around you. My wife once described driving a Jeep Wrangler cross-country as being better than sex, which was a bit upsetting at the time, but now <laughs> I can see what she means. This is just brilliant fun. <laughs> Only three things matter. Momentum, momentum, and momentum. You just... Have to take the discomfort in your stride and keep that power on. Never, ever back off. The British way, the way I've always been taught to climb sticky terrain, is this. Stop, analyse, low range, first gear, gentle revs, and then see if it'll pull you up. It doesn't work. Now let me show you the Arabic way, which is just... And, we're not. and that is how you get a puncture. Two problems. First, it's hard to jack a car up in soft sand, and second, I didn't have the key to unlock my spare wheel. What the marshals did here was bleed air from their spare tyre into my broken one. It was rather clever. Got some water, got a bottle of water. Oh, there it goes, there it goes. Now, we gotta go get see stuck that wrangler now. over there? Yeah. Now you know how exactly to do it, Joe. Yeah, you guys can go and help him. Oh, got my leg. It's gone. A puncture, though, is the least of your worries. When you crest a brow, how do you know what's on the other side? We're supposed to come from that side when car was standing here. So he's supposed to drive that side, but he missed the balance and banged the car. Yeah. 
wee rope yeah. with you. Yeah, he's going to bring it down. Got We've got a wee rope. Have you got a wee rope? We're going to need a wee rope because the damn things yeah, are stuck as I don't know what. Well, they'll just give you a wee snatch and you'll be out. Lawrence of Doncaster. <laughs> I don't get stuck. Much. Eventually, the desert is given back to the birds, which the Arabs like to hunt. In the old days, they'd come out here on camels, but today they prefer the ubiquitous Nissan patrol. They toughen up the suspension, and because there aren't that many children to run over in the desert, they fit bull bars. However, some people go an awful lot further. This is to the world of hunting vehicles what feta cheese is to the world of Greek cuisine. They've cut away the roof so the hunters have a panoramic view of the prey. They've taken out the carpets and fitted showers so they can wash away the blood and entrails. There's a gun rack should anything meaty come bouncing by. But best and most important of all, it has a V8. The rules work like this. The handler removes the bird's hood. He sees the prey, he gives chase. And I have to keep up. As you may have gathered, this is a tuned four and a half litre V8. As well it has to be, because that bird has been timed on radar at 280 miles an hour. because he's worth more than 3,000 quid. Timing's critical. I've got to get to the spot where he catches his prey at exactly the right moment. If I'm late, he'll be on the coffee and mints. It's weird, isn't it? Speed even plays its part in the oldest sport in Arabia. I tell you what's weirder still though, despite man's best endeavors, despite limitless petrochemical dollars, he is still the fastest thing in the Gulf. world are very appropriate. 